Hey, this is Big John Hart, former bodyguard for KISS, and I'm on the Cassius Morris Show. Get the fire out! Big John Hart, we have him on the line here, and the main reason we have you calling in is because of your autobiography, My Story. So how about you tell me about the autobiography? Uh, what inspired you to write it at this time, and what were the key elements that went into writing this book? Well, it's about me, my experiences in the you know, uh, recording business, and um, the reason I'm doing it now is I didn't want to do it earlier. <laughs> I didn't have the time. <laughs> but uh, uh, I ran out of excuses. My business partner, Steve Altman, you know, he was after me for a good number of years to uh, write this book. And I always uh, had an excuse of some kind, but I no longer have an excuse, so I'm doing it. Awesome. And how have you found the reception of the book so far? Are the fans really happy to be hearing all these stories coming out finally in an official forum? Everybody that I've come across has expressed an interest, and, and some were more exuberant than others, but everybody seems to think that uh, it'll be a great, great book. Certainly. I, I, I happen to agree, and uh, I think the listeners definitely agree as well. How about we go back and learn a little bit about Big John. Uh, where were you from originally? Where were you born, and what was it like growing up for you? I was born in New Jersey, you know, middle-class working family. Uh, grew up my early years in Newark, and I moved uh, to Passaic, New Jersey. And at that point, uh, when I finished school, I uh, got myself involved with the rock band, you know, doing cover tunes and things like that. And I did that for about a year. And uh, the fellow that, uh, one of the fellows that was in the band, him and another fellow decided to go to college. So they ended that run with that band. So at that point, I realized I didn't have the... Uh, the heart to wait for the big break. So I uh, pursued trying to find out how I could work for rock bands. Mm. Okay, at very that, interesting. At that point, I was on a ticket line, 1972, for the band The Grateful Dead at an outdoor venue. And it was strictly a ticket line. They, they were, you know, this was, these tickets were being sold for a show in the summer. This was springtime that we were online. Right. Anyway, uh, some people decided to uh, take it upon themselves that the box office was open. They got everybody else stirred up and started going forward. And we're in a barricaded area. A fellow that worked for the promoter who was out there, you know, attending the line, he approached me after the incident and asked me if I would like a, uh, a job. And I said, yeah, okay. And I started working there. And as it turned out, it was also a venue in my hometown that they were also involved in uh, called the Capitol Theater, and that was Passaic, New Jersey. And I want to work in there as well. So that really um, perked my interest overall about getting involved in the business. And, and I did everything I could uh, that was offered to me. I was in security. I did ushering. I did stagehand work. I learned how to run spotlights. I learned how to tune instruments. Uh, I really immersed myself in trying to learn what the aspects of the business were. During this time, you know, I've come across a lot of a lot of different acts. Made friends with a lot of different people. Uh, one of the persons that I made friends with was a fellow named Scooter Herring, who was um, the uh, road manager for the Allman Brothers. Okay. And he, he had a problem at the uh, Roosevelt Stadium uh, venue after his after the Allman Brothers show. Some fella got backstage and uh, took it upon himself to try to get on their tour bus. And when he you know, stopped the guy from getting on there, the guy got a little feisty. I seen what was going on and uh, dispatched the feisty one. And... Uh, um, Scooter offered me a job with them whenever they were in the Northeast area. So I worked with them whenever they were in 
you know, like from Philly to Boston. And I'd be okay. involved with shows for a time. But it just gave me another insight into the business. Uh, the fellow who hired me for Roosevelt Stadium, his name was Rick Stewart. And he also worked at the Capitol. He had been on the road with a couple of people. I think he was out with Lou Reed for a while and some of the others, uh, New York acts. He wound up going to work for KISS. Uh, not long after he started there, uh, they decided they needed another security man. He called me because I had expressed an interest to him that I wanted to get on the road. He asked me if I was still interested in that. I said, yeah. And uh, as it turned out, Kiss was playing the Capitol Theater in that very near future. So after that show that I worked, uh, I went and met the band. I knew the uh, tour manager at the time, J.R. Smalling. I had met him a few times in a different capacity. And, of course, Rick I knew. So I had an impromptu interview with the band at their hotel after the show. And, uh, you know, talked about basic things. They wanted to feel me out to see where my uh, my head was at with everything. Right. And uh, right. a couple of days later... I got a call from uh, the coin office to come in and meet with Bill. Okay, and I guess the rest is history. So on the spot interview, um, you know, there's so much to talk about when it comes to the Kiss years because you know you were so involved with them. I do want to stop, however, and go back a little bit and talk about the things, uh, the aspects of you that aren't discussed as much in interviews. So you mentioned that you were. Um, in a band in high school and you were really pursuing actually being on stage as a rock star. Uh, how far did you go with that? And what exactly contributed to you not having the heart to go for the big break? And do you wonder about that now about maybe if you would have? Well, I don't wonder about it. And it was after I got out of high school and, um, the, the, the driving force was I wanted to be in a music business at that mm. time. This is the early 70s, 69, 70, you know, uh, 31, 72. At that, at that era, there was no computers. There was no video games. You know, music was pretty much what everybody talked about and what was important to all the young people. I lived in a metropolitan area, so it lent itself to being able to see a lot of people uh, every weekend because there was many venues to go to in New York. Um, so, and that's what we would do. We would go and, you know, a lot of times you didn't even know who it was you were going to see by material. You may have heard of them or maybe heard one song on the FM radio station, the underground station, and um, you would go to see what they're all about. And then uh, after the weekend, you'd get together with your work buddies or your school buddies, and uh, discuss wh where you were, what you did, who you saw, and uh, it, it was really a great time for rock and roll then. You know, it was sort of yeah. the everyone's heyday, because it was, again, everybody was real keen on the music. Definitely. Well, that's that's really interesting. There was a sense of community around it. I can only imagine, especially in that area, you know, the amount of shows pouring through must have just been incredible. I wonder, you know, you mentioned Kiss. What do you think separates a group like Kiss who was in that scene uh, and doing all those small shows? Of course, other than the makeup and the physical appearance, what do you think separates a group like them and, say, the New York Dolls from the other bands who didn't make it out of that scene? Well, the Dolls got a modicum of, of success not as big as, as KISS. I think it, there's a combination of things that any band has to have to be successful, especially in that era. You, uh, you had to be not necessarily unique, but different. You also had to have, you know, some kind of musical direction that might be a little different from everybody else. Um, and then it was a matter of luck and drive. And mm -hmm. Lord knows, Kiss had to drive. And, I'm, you know, I believe there was a little luck involved. You know, they came across Bill of Coin. He came across them. You know, he, he made the promise to them, which he was managed to keep. And then, you know, as the, as the 
history books are written, you know, it, it turned into what they really wanted. But they had to put in a lot of effort before they became what everybody thinks of uh, Kiss now. You know, right. the, the the whole evolution of the show, their personas, um, the avenues that the band took musically, uh, the growing steps. You know, there, there, there's a lot of that. There's a lot involved with that that people really don't understand, and perhaps that sets them apart from the other bands like the New York Dolls. I mean, New York Dolls worked. I worked their shows too when uh, I was still doing the Capitol Theater. Mm -hmm. But there was a different uh, force there. For some reason, I think Kiss had a broader uh, appeal to people. Don't know why, it's just my personal opinion. Yeah. And when I started to work for them, they were workaholics. You know, there was no, I mean, I didn't start until the end, the very end of 75, and into 76, and we were doing then still six shows a week, seven if we could do it logistically. On the days off, uh, when there was one, they'd go into a, they'd try to find a uh, four track or eight track studio to work in, lay down tracks for the next upcoming album. So they were always driving, driving, driving towards that ultimate goal. Wow, you know, that's incredible. It, it, it really didn't take time off. We would come home. It might be half a week where, you know, you got to revisit your familiar or unfamiliar surroundings then. And, and then you were in the studio or you were going right back out on the road. Right. So you got home Holy to change smokes. clothes for the next season. Unbelievable. Wow. And I mean, I've, I've heard stories about Gene, especially and Paul, you know, just being workaholics for my whole life, but I definitely didn't know it was to that extent. That's insane. Uh, you mentioned all the shows at the Capitol Theater, you know, the Grateful Dead, uh, many other groups. What were the main things at that time in that era? This was the early 70s um, that you were warned to look out for as concert security. And did you feel well prepared enough from the beginning to where nothing overwhelmed you? Or, or were there ever moments where you thought, wow, you know, I didn't really think I was signing up for this? Well, I never felt overwhelmed. I, I always thought that I had a fair enough handle on things outlook wise. Um, you, what you looked out for then I mean, at the smaller venues like the Capitol or the Fillmore or uh, Academy of Music, those places, there was always people trying to sneak in through the side doors. You know, most of those uh, places that I mentioned were uh, old vaudeville theaters. So they had a thousand doors along the sides, you know, as panic doors in case of fire. Mm. So some of them worked well, some of them didn't. Some of them was easier to leave a jar. Uh, so you always had that particular threat. Not too long after I started working with uh, uh, the you know, venues, there came about the problem of uh, smoking. Because, you know, up until the, the, the early 70s, you get away with smoking in most venues. Fire laws changed. Fire marshals were showing up at shows, and they would shut down the show if they felt there was too much uh, smoking activity. And it wasn't, we're not talking about pot, we're talking about cigarettes. Right. Or cigars or pipes or anything else. So that became an issue. Okay. So it's an and that's still a big issue now. Oh, yeah, for sure. But it's not, it's not as uh, rampant, I don't think, because most people, you know, you, you had 20 some odd, 40 years uh, of, of growing up with you, you're not supposed to do that. Whereas in my era, when I started, it was commonplace to smoke everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, you smoke in the doctor's office. They so prescribe it, cigarettes. <laughs> oh, of course. Well, they, they smoked them too. Uh, I mean, it, it was, it was the whole, uh, the, the culture of the time. It wasn't a taboo item. Now, of course, there's, there's a zillion things out there about, why you should not smoke cigarettes and, and other forms of tobacco. And um, so 
the enforcement factor is already built in. You're not fighting a culture that has already been doing this for years, and now you're telling me to stop. It's the reverse. Right. Might make it any easier, but it's not as uh, prolific as it was right. back then. Okay. Well, yeah, good insight you know, on that. Those are little things that, that happen. <coughs> um, the, the maniacal band was, you know, other than the Beatles, you know, most people weren't that uh, over the top about the bands. They liked them uh, for sure. Um, and they voiced their opinion about the bands they particularly liked. But it wasn't that um, that ins insanity that went on with the Beatles and then with Kiss I seen. You know, so we didn't have much of that when I was working the venues. But you had a lot of drugs. You had people that would get out there on drugs and, uh, you know, lo lose where they were in time. So you'd have to deal with that kind of thing. And then it was just normal logistics of getting the acts in and out, getting loadouts done, loadouts in, load-ins. Uh, you know, so you always, um, there was always something to be, be doing and learning. And of course, as the industry started to stretch its legs, other things became more and more involved. Logistically, police-wise, when you moved into the bigger venues, there was a whole lot more to deal with. Everybody had a friend of everybody, so you had to watch for that because you know you, it would hurt your box office. You want, and uh, it was a, it was a uh, a progression of the past system. When I started working in rock and roll, there was no such thing as a real backstage pass. Oh wow. It was word of mouth, you're on the list, you got checked off, you were in. From that, it went to the promoters, would have uh, a, a pad printed up, like a receipt pad, mm -hmm. and it would have his name on it, and it'd be a couple of lines, and you could rubber stamp or hand write in the act and the date, and on there it would say backstage access. So those were given out, they were handed out, they weren't stick ons, they weren't hardcore. They weren't, um, you know, the laminated things that we know of today. Yeah. And when I did, I worked the, the Bob Dylan and the band tour in 74 at Madison Square Garden. They did four nights there, and we used campaign-type buttons. And it just said <laughs> tour 70. Well, that's it all was. Tour 74, and each night was a different color. And wow, I used so to you use must have had to be on the lookout for fakes all the time. Well, it wasn't so much fakes. It was you. You had to become accustomed to what the hell you were looking for, right? And then it be then you know. It, I mean, everything went hand in glove as uh, as the industry was growing, technology was growing. So you went from a a uh, a paper pass to something that could be stuck on. So then it became you got more graphics involved, and the promoters were doing it. But then the acts started to realize you had no control of how many were being given out. Mm. So, of course, the, the promoters uh, felt obligated to take care of all their buddies and the record guys in town to, uh, that were spinning the tunes or whatever. So, you know, there was a plethora of people backstage that you had no idea who they were. So that started to change. The bands started making up their own passes so that they would have absolute control of who was in their areas oh, okay so it would minimize the hangers on and those kinds of people that would just end up in the area for the most part yeah but uh, there again you know there's, if there's a rule there's always ways to bend it yeah you know i i can remember you know with my kiss uh passes we were in uh shreesport louisiana and i was the one issuing the passes and this fella kept on showing up backstage with a pass, and he was fairly inebriated. And he was just in the way. If he had stood to the side and just observed, he would have been fine. But he wound up getting in my way. So I put him out oh twice. The third time, I um, it's end of show. 
I had the limousines backed in. I got the band coming off stage. And here's this knucklehead between the two limousines. <laughs> and I was incensed. I said, who let this knucklehead back in? So I went up and I grabbed a hold of him and, you know, uh, bum rushed him to the door, the backstage door. And I looked at his pass and I took the pass off him. And I just stuck it in my pocket. And I told the local security people, do not let him back in. <laughs> I got the band in the cars and we left. So we get uh, back to the hotel and I get the band in. And I, of course, I clean out my pockets and all after the show. And I look and I come across this pass. And look at it here. It's got a, a connotation on it that tells me that that's from a caterer. So he oh was friends with catering people. Oh my gosh! See, so, so I can imagine that was just a huge problem. Well, you you you, you know, if that's why you wanted limited access, and and depending on the venue, you had in some places better control than others. You know, at this particular venue in Shreveport, the kitchen setup open to the outside to was direct access, which was convenient for the catering people because they can load in food and their equipment and so forth. But the door for that was not the backstage door. So this fella being a friend, he can get in and out at will. There was no problem there. Right. You know, you always, there's always problems, holes, you know, uh, th that you come across that, you know, when you tour as much as uh, I did, you learn them. So when you come back the next time, you know how to prevent that particular problem from, from happening. Doesn't mean you won't find another one, but at least you got that one done. Yeah. Right. I can imagine it's just an, an ongoing progression. And, uh, you know, I mean, but that is why they hire people like you, you know, to adapt to those situations and roll with those punches fast. I do wonder, and I got to ask you about it. How did the dimension of Kiss having the makeup and having to hide their faces add to that pressure? Because it must have just, you know, created a bunch of different hurdles for you to jump through, right? It, it did. In the beginning, it, it was, we didn't view it as such, you know, because it, it wasn't emphasized. And it didn't really come out to, uh, like, oh, we can't let them get photographed. That developed. I mean, when I started working for them, that became a thing. You know, in the 75, 76, it was definitely, we have to address this now. Up until that point, you know, 74 into 75, you know, they didn't get a lot of respect from the press, you know, the, the music press. So there wasn't a great clamoring to find out anything about these guys. Right. However, as they started to gain popularity, uh, which is due to the fans mostly, because the rock mag still didn't give them much credibility. You know, they they they, uh, they weren't favorable towards the band at all for a long time. Yeah, but that didn't stop true. them. They were determined, you know, in spite of uh, certain articles being written and like, well, I'll write them off, they're a, they're a three chord wonder and all that kind of stuff. Um, they pursued what they wanted to and became successful. But during that little period there where the fans were starting to make an impact and there was no denying that they had a following. That's when they wanted to know more about the band. And that's when we had to figure out how to keep them hidden. Cause we realized that there was a beauty to that, that mystique, you know, was something to preserve. That's now, whether so interesting. It was or management, you know, I remember being told, Hey, look, we really can't have these guys photographed. So what are we going to do about that? And I can remember talking with uh, Rick Stewart and and uh, J.R. Smalling, who was a tour manager when I started, that um, how are we going to, you, know, you know, first you start with the how, and and then you get the answers. You know, you sit there and think about things. Well, if we got to move them in and out of uh, the hotel and get them into the venue, how are we going to do this? Uh, luckily, uh, as the venues got to be bigger, you could drive right in. Most of the limousines of the time had tinted windows. So that helped a great deal. On the venues that we, when I started out, they were not as accessible. You couldn't drive in, had to walk them in. 
Well, we had to be prepared for that. We had to have more security outside. We told them in particular what we're looking for. The band was aware. And, you know, you have seen pictures of them with themselves covering their faces with their hands. And and that became ingrained in them. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was so ingrained in Gene. I was at the office, Bill Coyne's office, and I was taking pictures of the uh, all the office staff who were playing the garden. And of course, they all had to have you know laminated passes and be treated special, which is okay. So I was taking pictures, and uh, I knew Gene was coming down the hall. So I held back and waited for him to walk from the hallway into an open area. And sure enough, he had his he had his hand up. He knew how he was going to snipe him. Wow. That's insane. So it was just now, it was just their muscle memory. Well, that's it. They, they, they realized, especially Gene. I mean, Gene was the, was the driving force of Kiss as far as he lived it. It was the most important thing to him at the time. He was that much taken up with the importance of the brand without really, that, that, that term hadn't been coined yet, but that's what it was. He understood the validity of, if you're gonna be kissed, that's all you're gonna be. You have to, you have to keep that around you. Outside, well, it's a different story. But if you're, at a, if you're working for the band and you're representing the band, then you should be wearing the band. Right. I've actually seen him do a video um, with an interviewer recently where it was a few years ago and he did get actually a lot of controversy about this, but I don't necessarily think it's too bad, but he, he actually asked the interviewer to take his Iron Maiden shirt and swap it for a Kiss shirt and put it on and he went and got him a Kiss shirt. So that's interesting that he even told you all the way back then, if you don't have a Kiss shirt, I will get you one. And he's still doing that to this day. That's pretty wild, I think. Well, I, I, heard, I also heard about that. And, and Gene... You know, sometimes his humor is a little strange. Yeah. You know, he just wants a guy to get on his side and, you know, wear the Kiss shirt for the time they were there, like he's supporting Kiss. So I believe that's where the standpoint was for Gene. Other people interpret it like, hey, you're giving this guy a hard time. He's trying to fit in, you know, as a rock and roller, and maybe that's the only T-shirt he got. Maybe, but, you know, Gene was giving him a T-shirt. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a, uh, a standoff there. Plus, I don't believe it was in the States. I think it was somewhere outside of the States or the gentleman was from outside of the States. So he might not have understood what Gene was talking about exactly anyway. But that's another exactly. story. But they, they exactly. you know, they, they all had that, uh, that particular type of it's about us. And, and they strove to keep it that way. Definitely. Now, do you think that it would have been possible in this day and age with all the cell phones and the social media and all that kind of stuff that we have now to keep their identity hidden? And because, you know, I don't know if it's doable now. I think it would be nearly impossible. Somebody else had asked me this question at one of the Kiss Expos. And quite frankly, I don't believe that they would have enough discipline to pull it off. Because they would have to live in a bubble. Yeah. And and the accessibility would have to be, be almost nil. And then the movements would have to be well choreographed, even from their homes. So I think that it would be pretty much a lost cause with the amount of, of cameras that are available. I mean, even your... your your cell phone cameras now are pretty good quality. So oh yeah, it would be really, really, really difficult to remain uh, completely out of sight with that. Plus, there's four of them, so that's hard to do. You know, so somebody's going to drop the ball somewhere, and if if some person is in the right place at the right time, that game would, it would be game over. That's right, right, I guess. And I think I feel like people would make it a crusade, uh, you know, to finally reveal them, especially with all the access to the cameras. So it is interesting oh, yeah. to think about. That, that would be, I mean, if you had made that a focal point that, well, they've never been seen without their makeup, then that was that would be like a rallying cry. Well, we're going to find that out. 
we're right. going to make that happen. So it would be it would be a big uphill battle to keep that under wraps. I know there's an artist now, and I don't. It's a female. Um, I don't know her name, Sia, but I've seen I her believe. on. Was it? I believe it's Sia. And maybe, and she has like black hair, white hair, or something like that, and she mm. keeps it over her face. And you know, to the best of my knowledge, when I was watching the program, nobody knows what she looks like. But you're only talking about one person. You can uh, you can orchestrate that, I think, a lot easier because you know once you get into a hotel situation, you could dress in a million different ways and get out, and yeah. people you know wouldn't put and you know wouldn't as long as you're they don't see you coming out the door that you went in, they can't put two and two together. So you know you have a better shot at it. And plus, she's not out and about that often. Right. Exactly. And there's only one of her, as you say. That's very true. I got a, a post on Facebook, and somebody wanted me to ask you this um, about going back into a biker bar to retrieve Ace Fraley's coat after a brawl. Can you tell us anything about that? <laughs> I, was, I was in East St. Louis. We were in St. Louis. We had played there the night that happened. Or no, the night before. We, um, we were at the hotel. Now, the, the past two or three times that we went through St. Louis, we had made friends with two local policemen. They took us to the shooting range. You know, they'd they come and hang out with us. They're nice guys. So they decided, and they came over because we had a day off in St. Louis. Uh, they come over and said, we'd like to take, you know, whoever wants to go out, we'll take these guys out around you know, show you the town like thing. So uh, Ace wanted to go. At first he didn't want to go because we were sitting in Trader Vic. Then he decided he wanted to go. And then Peter wanted to go. Gene and Paul didn't want to go. Eddie wanted to go. And Rosie wanted to go. So I said, well, you guys go. I'll stay here with the other two. So they went there. And lo and behold, they went to a place in East St. Louis which is a very rough area. And these two particular policemen had had run-ins with the owners of this particular nightclub. Okay. So, so from what I got out of the, the story after the fact was they went there to try to uh, show up these guys that own the club. Like, well, we know these guys, you know, they're friends with us, not you type of thing. (laughs) Anyway, it turned into a battle with them. The cops lost their guns. Cops got beat up pretty good. Ace and Peter, Eddie and Rosie, got them out, but they forgot the jacket. Oh. So the following day, we went back and got the jacket. And, you know, it was a little, a little uh, unnerving, but uh, we were successful. And they never went back to that place again, obviously. Oh, my gosh. I can only imagine you would avoid it like the plague. That's hilarious. I, I've heard so many great stories about Ace and Peter. Uh, you know, they were fantastic musicians, but they must have been something else to be touring with. I mean, the things you must have seen. They, uh, they, they could be quite entertaining on most nights. Right. But uh, somebody said, who gave you the most problems? And I said, well... It depends on what day. It could be Ace, could be Peter. You know, it, it just depends. And and you know, it depends on what's uh, what's the driving force for that day. You know, I said to somebody else, in in the amount of work that we did touring wise, you know, we were always on the go. So you're not home, and you know, if there's a problem at home for anybody, then that affects everyone on tour because it affects the individual. So, you know, that would go through things and, and you know, you, you, you're, you're your own little family out there, even though you're not related, but you're related due to work. Right. And everybody has their own way of letting off steam. Uh, and sometimes it could be good fun. Sometimes it was a pain in the ass. Uh, you know, Ace wasn't the, Ace was a good drunk. He wasn't vicious at all. You know, he's a happy guy. But he was a sloppy guy. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we were out 
you know, I wound up, I, I, if I had the money that I gave away to people for their clothing to get dry cleaned and or replaced, I'd be a rich fella. Right. But they other than that, out there. pardon? They were just out there going reckless. Well, pretty much, but, but, but it was a control recklessness. Remember, the, 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 all of the rock stars at that particular time were uh, idolized for their shenanigans. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. heard about Led Zeppelin, you know, throwing shit out of beating up the Plaza Hotel in New York. Uh, Rod Stewart doing some stuff. Um, you know, and, and there's other stones. There's all kinds of things that went on. And, and you know, it's a combination of, you know, what, what made that happen is, is you're isolated. You're not functioning as a normal human being because you're not in a normal human being setting every day yeah. you're at a party for somebody so you know sometimes you feel obligated to get in the swing of things because you're just not feeling like you are so that leads to you know further silliness mm. again mm. you know the the uh the choices at the time alcohol uh drugs were sanctioned by everybody I, you know, I mean, I, I've been to, to, uh, you, you hear the stories about record company executives, you know, and, and, uh, business executives involved in rock and roll. And you go to their either businesses or their, their homes and there was drugs everywhere. So yeah. it was really hard to, yeah. uh, to, uh, paint a bad picture about those two fellows when they were definitely not alone in any way, shape or form. Certainly. That's a great point. I think that a lot of people would overlook. And, you know, there, there's another part to that. And we talked about how hard it was for Kiss to climb to the top. And, you know, these were really young guys and suddenly they're all millionaires. So, you know, if you add that to all the circumstances that you just stated, it certainly makes sense that things aren't all going to be peaches and cream here. Uh, but we certainly do love the legacy that they left behind. On the Kiss years, is there anything else you can tell us about a standout moment or a really interesting point uh, before you stopped working with them? Well, well, there's lots of things. A lot of them is in the book. But uh, the only time that I felt, like you asked me earlier on, I just thought of it, where I felt uh, a little uneasy was in Milan, Italy. We had a problem okay. there with, uh, with the... Um, with the, the local people. Uh, evidently, at that time in Italy, uh, now I, I believe it's changed, but I'm not positive, there was no right to a public assembly like we have here in the States. So if you wanted to get on a soapbox and tell everybody how wonderful you think Trump is, and the other guy across the street's on his soapbox telling you how lousy Trump is, you couldn't do that there. <laughs> right. So they would use gatherings to be political because they'd get inside and they could voice their opinions because pretty much you know you're, you're sort of running amok anyway the police are on the outskirts and you're really not uh not having a a, a hard time to uh, express yourself but we were told by the promoter he came to me and the road manager at the time george suet and said, so I need, uh, I think it was like 90 passes, 90 or 100. And I was like, what? For who? And he proceeded to tell me a story about uh, this group that was called the Red Brigade, Rojo Brigado, and how that, uh, you know, he gave us a little insight into his political stuff. And he said, you know, it will probably be in our best interest to give them the passes because that's this way they get in. He said, they don't need, they're not coming backstage. That's not their interest. They want to be inside. They don't want to pay for it. And they want to be political. Wow. So we thought about it. And I said, well, I guess. He said, well, maybe you should hear about this first. He said, uh, when Santana was here a couple of months ago, um, they chose not to give him the pass. And they got in anyway, and they burned up half of Santana's stage. Oh, so 
I said, well, it's probably better to give him the pass. We gave him the pass, and he got in, and right between Iron Maiden and Kiss going on, uh, the uh, shit hit the fan. So the local police, there's two, there's two police forces in Italy. There's the local guys, and then there's a thing called the Cabagnari. And one of them is local, and the Cabagnari, I think, is the state. Anyway, they got in there and sort of separated these people. We had to deal with a few of them who tried to meander backstage and uh, got unceremoniously put out. And uh, we went on stage to start the show, and they started all over again. <clears throat> so when we brought the, the band back, I didn't want to leave them up there. They were throwing rocks and shit at the uh, no, big rocks at the oh. stage. So we went back to the dressing room, and it, there was a velodrome, which is a bicycle uh, stadium. So the way you would access the, uh, the stadium part, you know, for the field is an underground tunnel. That's how we were getting to the stage. So okay. I brought them down, went back to the dressing room with a couple of guys in the dressing room that worked for me, uh, Chuck Merriman and uh, a guy named Inez Barreto. And um, they uh, were instructed to stay with the band. If things get really funky, jump in a car and split. So I went back down the tunnel. Uh, George Sue was already down there. And we barricaded the tunnel with some wardrobe cases, which were at least six feet tall then. But some of these knuckleheads got over the cases and thought they were going to just, like, run amok. That didn't happen, I can tell you. Yeah, I can and, imagine uh, it didn't. No, it did. So we, we everything wound up getting sorted out again by the police. And at that point, we chose to go out and do the show. And we got out there, and it sort of was tense, but we got through it. You know, no more incidents. And then that evening, when we got back after the show, everybody sort of hung out in my room. Right. You know, just sort of talking about what went on. Because it was different for us. We never had that kind of thing. I mean, we, we've seen protests in the 60s, stuff like that. Uh, people getting shot even over that. But to experience it firsthand and have that lack of knowledge about what's going on and not no control of the language of the country that you're in uh, is definitely unnerving. Wow. That's like some action movie type stuff right there. That's insane. Well, I appreciate you uh, thinking back to one of my early questions and coming back with a great response for it. Um, there's just a couple quick little things I wanted to cover before we end off this interview. I thank you again for your time. Uh, oh, you joined thanks. Prince on the 1987 Love Sexy tour for the Europe I... and U.S. Uh, legs of that tour. I just want to know, you got to talk to him quite a bit on this tour from what I've heard and even see him in the studio. What kinds of things were discussed with Prince and what was he like to talk to as an actual human being off stage? Pretty much he's an actual human being. He didn't say much. Uh, to me, anyway, we had brief conversations. He was uh, pretty much engulfed with his music. He did, you know, he would he worked the band hard. They put in long hours in rehearsals at the studio, and then uh, you know the thing he's famous for is playing another show. After the show, he played, and uh, he would do that wherever he could when we were going through Europe and the states. Um, he just he just loved being on stage. I think it was his way of uh, giving back to the people. He just when he'd do the the after show, as we called it, um, <clears throat> he'd play for hours, you know. And, and he didn't charge a lot of money, you know. Basically, the amount of money charged would take care of paying the uh, the band for, for the extra hours, all the road crew, people like myself, and um, he he just play and play and play. As an individual, he seemed very deep, uh, you know, a deep thinker type guy. Um, didn't share too much outside of his inner circle. The people uh, around him were very tight-lipped. And, uh, you know, they were protective of him. He's a little, little bitty guy. I was surprised how tiny he was. Yeah. But nice guy, all the same. And, and, you know, during my tenure with them, the, the biggest conversations we had would be where we're going 
for the after show. He'd come off stage and he would have made a decision or found out the information where it could be done and he'd pass that on to me. And then I was off to that particular place to um, get it sorted out so he could show up and play for another four or five hours. <clears throat> Holy me. smokes. That's insane. But so he, he really but, just let the music do the talking. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, he didn't pay too much attention to uh, the management situation. He was big on the shows. When we went to uh, Europe, he had a great uh, interest in uh, keeping people safe because all the shows were outdoors. So I know they wound up getting every piece of barricade steel that was available in Europe. And we, we had a three barricade system in front of the stage so that you would, uh, when the door is open, you come in and we would cut it off. You know, as the first area started to fill, we judged it visually. Everybody in that section would get a wristband. Then we'd open up the next section behind it, same thing. Then the third section, and behind that was just definite general admission. So, I mean, and the, the people with the wristbands were general admission, but it was Prince's choice to uh, have these barricades in place so that they couldn't really get, you know, squished. Because I've seen that happen many times in my career where, you know, people, they, they, due to their exuberance, you know, they get one behind the other and they pack themselves like sardines and inevitably somebody gets hurt. Exactly. Well, that's really good that Prince took a, an interest in actually keeping those fans safe. I mean, it can be a really dangerous environment. Um, the last question I really wanted to ask you was, you talked a lot about how you had to, you know, not so gracefully, as you put it, get people out of situations, throw them out of there. You've often, you know, you've been famous for breaking cameras when people were trying to take photos of Kiss and all those iconic things. Do you think that that is a lot more difficult for bodyguards now in this day and age? And if you were actively doing those things now, uh, how do you think you would approach it? Would it be any differently? Yeah, of course. Everybody wants to sue you now. Right. Um, you, you wouldn't be able to to uh, have that type of direct con conflict with people. You would have to, again, a lot, it would be a lot more brain power involved and a lot more uh, people involved to come and go. Because you, you, you would have to keep them at a distance <clears throat> with a moving barricade, which would be people. I, you know, if you, uh, every now and then, Justin Bieber comes down here to uh, South Florida. And he has a, an entourage of 10 people easily. Just security. Yeah. <clears throat> to get in and out of places. Because he gets mobbed. And, of course, today, the paparazzi types and even the fans, <clears throat> they feel that because they like you or they bought one of your records uh, or, you know, a ticket to go see you, that they now own you. Same thing with yeah. the paparazzi. They think that because you, you're a, a star or famous in some degree, that they can do whatever they want to take a picture of you. And I think that's really, a, uh, I can't find a word. But it's not a great situation, and I think our our laws, the way they're written, doesn't protect those individuals. It protects the general public, but I don't believe they needed that much protection. You know, when you the, the people that are that are the stars of today, they almost have no privacy at all. And and you know, I experienced it even before I wound up getting out of the business. You know, you'd be sitting eating in a restaurant and people would come over and ask for an autograph. And you'd say, well, okay, when uh, they're finished eating, they'd be more than happy to give you an autograph. And they would say, well, I finished my meal. We're leaving now. <laughs> and I'd say, well, I guess you're going. So you know, without finished. an autograph. Right. But see, it, my point was the people don't give a shit about you. It's all about them. Right. Especially you know, when you're, you know, I can only imagine for Kiss since they had the makeup and the whole personas, you know, it, it made people even more attracted to them probably than the average rock group. 
Could be. <laughs> but I still remember I still remember people asking me if I ever seen them without their makeup. All right, well, great. Which I thought was <laughs> the silliest question I ever got. But people genuinely believe that's the way they look all the time. Or that, that they would have their makeup on all the time. All right, then. I remember, I remember we pillow. Would, yeah. Well we we wound up telling people after a while we said, Oh, didn't you hear? That's tattooed on. That never comes off. <laughs> And, and, and they would go, wow, cool. Yeah, yeah. And we would just let them think that. <laughs> there were so many conspiracy theories. I remember, of course, you you must know the Gene Simmons cow's tongue. You guys must have loved that one. Oh, sure. Absolutely. The and the, they were knights in Satan's service and devil worshippers. God knows what. They ran the gamut. That's hilarious. Hey, Big John, I, I just want to say again, I really thank you for your time. Uh, this has been some wonderful insight into the world of KISS and the music business. And I want to let all my listeners here on the Cassius Morris Show know that the book, My Story by Big John Hart, the autobiography, is available now. They're doing pre-orders right now, I believe. Is that right? Uh, yeah. If you go to Pledge Music and uh, um, sign on there with my name, there's a whole bunch of stuff being offered uh, that, that the fans can take a look at including the book for pre-sales. That's right. And that's at pledgemusic.com slash Big John Hart. Correct. And there's, there's video clips that are running that we've uh, got little little pieces of interviews with me talking about the band. So, um, you know, I think I think they would find it quite interesting. And there's some really cool uh, things that uh, I'm offering as incentives to, to participate. Awesome. Well, I'm sure uh, most of our listeners will definitely be checking that out. I know I will. And Big John, uh, you have a great evening here. And again, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Very much appreciated. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys and, of course, all the fans. And uh, thank you again. Hopefully we'll see you soon.